Hi, my name is Leon Higley. I'm the I'm a professor of applied ecology here in the School of Natural Resources, and I'm the instructor for Principles of Ecology, um, NRES 220, uh, for this spring semester, spring 2018. And of course, this lecture is addressed to students taking the distance version. Although I suppose it's possible some of the resident students may also uh, get a look at some of these lectures. Uh, what I want to do with in this relatively brief video is to quickly review um, some of the features and issues in the course and then in a separate video I'll do the um, uh, introduction to ecology as a subject that was associated with the on-campus version of this lecture. In front of you is a copy of the syllabus. Uh, I'll show you the, the Canvas site for the course here in a moment, but um, as this indicates um, I've taken the resident syllabus changed it slightly and most of the stuff here in here uh, corresponds the same for both courses I'll, I'll just go through this quickly and then but I would hope you would take the time to read it because there are issues that will come up um, so any in any case you have my contact information and in particular in here notice my cell phone number and feel free to give me a text or call but I'm an old guy you know so you call after 10 there's no telling whether you're gonna get me or I'm going to ignore it um, your teaching assistants, assistants excuse me, are Kelly Willemsons and Amber McInnes, and they'll be giving you uh, ways to contact them uh, by contacting you guys directly. They, they got mad at me when I put their cell numbers in in the, in the past, so I, I guess they have to decide how they want, they want you to do this. We will um, communicate mostly through Canvas. Uh, I'll be posting these videos on YouTube. Uh, through a, I guess it's called a private channel or whatever, but in any case, your links will be there in um, on the website. Let's see, what's next? Um, we have one required book, uh, Rick Cliffs and Rhea, uh, the 2014 Ecology, the Economy of Nature. I, I always called it the Economy of Nature. Um, truthfully, I cannot find my copy. I can find my copy of the sixth edition, not the seventh. It's a good text. Um, for the lectures, I'll make reference to chapters in that book. One of the things I love about the book is that it has um, chapters that are really written to learn from, by which I mean they'll have key objectives. The book itself is well written. There's lots of illustrations, good examples, and then a summary at the end of what you need to know. So I, I also like this edition's coverage. It, it included some topics that weren't traditionally in there. In, in, excuse me, in ecology texts. Now, <clears throat> the other thing you need to be aware of is that I have a requirement that you read a book that pertains to both ecology and society and write a review of that. Not a friggin' report, but a review in which I want to get your reactions to the book. Now, in my opinion, the best book for this and the one I'm going to recommend is The Worst Hon Ta Hard Time, which is a discussion of the history of the Dust Bowl here in the central, central and s southern part of the plains of the United States. But there's any number of books that'll work. Another one I recently read was this book by uh, Sonia Shah, uh, Fever, How Amer uh, Malaria Has Ruled Humankind for uh, 500,000 Years. Really terrific book. In both instances, the books address ecological issues, but they also talk about how they impact human beings. And that's going to be an important theme in the class, because unlike probably a lot of your science courses, ecology is, is or can be viewed as a completely pure science, but it has so many applications and, and so much significance to human activities that it's very difficult to really teach uh, ecology in a, in a broad way, at least in my opinion, without addressing places where ecology um, interacts and informs human decision making, how societies work, a whole variety of issues. Okay, so I have my course objectives, and one thing I want to say about this is that um, I'm not. I have I have little or no interest in you memorizing things and regurgitating them back to me, but I have a great deal of interest in your taking information, and forming your own conclusions and your own judgments. And in particular, I really would like to work with you to develop your skills at forming logical argumentation, an argumentation whereby you take a group of facts, you evaluate those, and you can come to an informed conclusion about what those things tell us. That's really at the heart of a lot of what we do in ecology, 
because ecology is very much about understanding complex inter interrelationships between organisms and, and then trying to uh, interpret what the what that new understanding, how that let, lets us get to yet another uh, prediction or another, not another insight about nature. Okay. Uh, what else? Oh, grading. Okay. Look, as I like to say, in an ideal world in which you are perfect students and I am per a perfect teacher, obviously everyone should get A's. So I have never understood a teaching philosophy that involves not having too many A's or grading on a curve or any of these other crazy notions. So as far as I'm concerned, a measure of success is how well you guys do. Now, that said, there's two ways you can look at grades. You can look at them as a way to evaluate your knowledge and understanding, which of course is a crock. Or we can also, and another way we can look at it is as a way to motivate you so that if you don't do this, you'll receive some penalty, I guess, to a bad grade or maybe a reward through a good grade if you look at it like that. Um, as you can tell, I have really mixed uh, feelings about grades. Um, we have to have them, obviously, but they're not the key focus. They're not my key focus. I don't evaluate really my worth or your worth based on, those, on the grades. However, I will say this. When I read your assignments and when I read your, your uh, exams and so forth, it, it does give me an insight to the degree of understanding that you're bringing to the, the, the same things I'm trying to teach. So from that standpoint, they serve a really valuable function, particularly in a case like this where I don't get to meet with you or talk to you on a regular basis. And so we don't have, I don't have that opportunity to sort of judge where I'm having an impact as an instructor and where I'm not. So. That said, this is a rough uh, breakdown of points, and if you guys will be kind to me, there may be some flexibility. For example, the first weekly quiz, which should have been five points, we're not going to have, so I'll probably end up giving everybody five free points. I'm going to guess you're not going to hold that against me, but whatever. Um, as far as these exams go, which seems to be a big um, issue of concern for students going into any course, the exams are all take home. They're all open book. And what that should tell you then is that the type of questions I ask on those exams are going to be interpretive questions, which means how you justify your answer is what matters. In fact, that matters more than what your answer is. And as proof of that, there will be occasions, given the nature of the question, where you may answer or a student, someone else may answer with something I know not to be correct. But if it's well supported, sufficiently well supported, in the argumentation and it addresses all the core issues, I may end up actually giving it full credit. That should also mean then that the reverse is true and it definitely is. You can have the right final answer, but if you don't justify that answer and explain your logic and show how it's supported, you're not gonna receive full credit. Don't freak out about this. We'll talk about it as we go along and uh, I'll give you some examples before we get there. The other thing that I, uh, the other seed I guess I wanna plant is that while there are four exams in the course, that last exam is the final and it's comprehensive. But I'm only counting three exams, which means if you do well on the first three exams, there's no need to take the final. By the same token, if you bomb one of the exams, don't completely freak out because I only take the top three. Okay? Uh, the grading scale is probably going to be straight 10 point. That's usually what it has been. And let's see, I don't know what the real schedule is. I've never known. And despite the fact that I've taught this course, what, five years, two times a year, I must have caught it 10 or 12 times, I guess, something like that. I still don't know. I can tell you it's roughly like this, in which we talk about um, scientific investigation, some principles of ecology, this stuff we cover very quickly. And then we'll start talking about abiotic factors. So it's the topics we're going to talk about, this is a pretty good summary. And so I can just tell you, historically, mostly people focused on this one, population ecology. I remember when I took ecology, my first ecology course back in the 70s, um, I would guess that probably 80% of my course was on population issues, much less on other things. Certain topics that we'll be talking about, I had no training in, uh, talking about the significance of parasitism and disease. Um, I don't think I have it on my list here, which shows I need to update this, but um, we'll be talking about sociality, 
that'll probably occupy at least two or three lectures. Um, so there's a variety of topics that weren't traditionally in ecology that have since emerged to be more important. The class schedule, mostly imaginary. Uh, I'm going to try to stick to these exam dates so that you have some prep um, as best I can. So you'll notice I don't sort of have a list here of exactly what the topics are. I'll probably fill in that list after the fact. But let's see. Oh, why you might want to drop the course. I added this a couple years ago uh, because of student, uh, a round of student complaints. I had a group of anti-vaxxers in the class who really took offense at some comments I made critical of the anti-vax movement. And I've had the same thing happen occasionally with students who uh, don't accept evolution, which strikes me as a really peculiar position to be in if you're taking a science course. But let me cut to the quick on this, and it, it actually speaks to a bigger issue. Um, as I'm speaking to you right now, there's been an ongoing controversy at the University of Nebraska and other campuses regarding the role of professors uh, trying to shift student opinion and liberal versus conservative issues and these sorts of things. Look, guys, let me tell you what I've told many people about opinions. I am an extremely logical person. And because I'm logical and because I've been trying to train myself to look at things and not hold on positions I shouldn't have, obviously I believe all my opinions are correct. The problem with my position is that throughout my life I have found occasions when my opinion was wrong and I've had to change it. And the dilemma I have is I can't tell my, my incorrect opinions from my correct opinions. The real point that I'm trying to make here is I took a long time to build my opinions and you can't have them. They're mine. My job here is not to try to brainwash you into th anything. It's to try to get you to think for yourself. And really the critics of universities and the critics of uh, who claim that uh, professors are brainwashing students or something else are what they're really should be criticizing is this point I just made. It's not that they object, it's not really that professors are in the practice of trying to turn out a bunch of robots who think the way they do. It's that if we do our jobs, you think for yourself. And that is likely to challenge any number of beliefs or opinions you previously held. And for some people, that's profoundly challenging. I'll say this, if I didn't teach you things in which you might disagree or which there might be controversy, I would not be doing my job. Now on that point, we need to draw a big distinction between points of opinion and points of fact. A lot of what we're going to be doing in here is talking about questions of fact. I'll be discussing many topics in ecology where we don't know what the final answer is. But there are any number of things where we do. And part of what I want to be careful about in class is distinguishing opinion from fact. So I'm not afraid to talk to you about my opinions, and I definitely will. Um, let me give you a good example. We'll talk about conservation ecology. Conservation ecology is not a science. It can't be. Now, why did I say that? Because of the word conservation. There's nothing in science that says we have to conserve anything. If, as we'll discuss, science is this business about trying to objective, understand the objective reality of the universe, then that doesn't have anything to do with whether or not we should conserve a species or a habitat or anything else. That's a human values judgment. And so you can see, even in, a, even in what is regarded as a discipline, a conservation ecology, there's journals for conservation ecology, you've got to remember that conservation ecology represents a field in which uh, it's a marriage of science plus certain human perspectives. There's lots of these. Um, forensic science is like that. Uh, to some degree, agricultures, uh, agricultural sciences are like that. And so they, those sorts of areas have both a dimension that includes um, opinion or perspective or ethical considerations that's distinct from the way you do science. Now let me tell you some things that aren't like that. Uh, a belief in Atlantis. The notion that the earth is flat, uh, vaccination denial, climate change denial, 
uh, faith healing, homeopathy, uh, the humoral theory of disease. All of those things are not matters of opinion. They're just wrong. Now, why should you accept my statement that they're wrong? Because I'm a scientist and, say they're, and, and I say they're wrong? Some people seem to think that if you count the number of heads who say something's wrong, that determines whether it's true or false. Most scientists will say they don't care how, what the opinions are of other scientists. So as an example, I'm not persuaded that human-induced uh, climate change is occurring because 95% of the climatologists polled happen to, happen to think the same thing. I'm persuaded because I looked at the evidence, I used my own judgment, even given though that I'm not a climatologist, and I think that evidence is overwhelming. I don't really need 95 out of 100 climatologists to tell me that. In science, it's the weight of evidence that we use to judge. It's not uh, because it's traditional. It's not because I have a feeling. And that's why in uh, one of our early lectures here, I want to talk to you about exactly what science is and isn't, how we make decisions, so that all of us are on the same playing field when, we, when I start talking about these sorts of issues. Now, let me make one other observation. It's, it's my um, experience that if you hold a certain belief and you're challenged about that belief, you will always have an emotional response. I think that's true for any of us. But we cannot attach emotion, or at least try not to attach emotion, to our psych scientific opinions. And by that I mean if... Um, Oh, what's a good example? Here's an example where I was wrong. Um, there was a discussion about who the closest relatives are to the insects. I'm trained as an entomologist. And a lot of molecular biologists have said the evidence suggests that the crustaceans are the cl most closely related. And I always thought that was a crazy thing, because if the crustaceans are the most closely related to the insects, that would imply that all of the group of insect-like things, the arthropods, the spiders, the scorpions, they must have had a different ancestry than the insects, and they must have appeared on land separately from the insects. Why do I say that? It's because crustaceans are largely a marine group, and they're very far removed from things like um, ticks and spiders and scorpions and a, and a variety of these sorts of organisms. And I thought it was very unlikely that you'd have multiple groups coming on land versus there being one group that came on land and then suddenly radiated. Okay, that was my scientific opinion, and those were some reasons. I was dead wrong. It's, as time has progressed, the evidence becomes over more and more compelling that these insects are very closely related crustaceans, and all of the things we thought before about relationships between these organisms are different. Now, I don't know if I put you to sleep with this, but here's what the real point is. The point is, those sorts of opinions are based on evidence, and I'm forced to change my opinion based on strength of evidence. I have no interest in trying to change your religious views, your political views, your views about economic systems, but I do have a great deal of interest in making certain that your perspective, understanding, and even your opinion about scientific issues are valid, and you know the difference between ones that's valid and one that's invalid. One of the reasons that I will make this statement that extrasensory perception absolutely does not exist is because there is no evidence for it. And when I mean no, I mean there's no legitimate scientific evidence ever that shows a single example of extrasensory perception working. Let me say that again. Despite all of the things you've read in newspapers and so forth, there's nothing in the scientific literature that passes the requirements for any sort of scientific data that would support a claim that extrasensory perception exists. To me, that's, and when, when I use the word, there's no examples, that's a pretty strong statement, right? So that's why I can, I can make a strong opinion or make a, a strong statement like extrasensory perception doesn't exist. Okay. Um, as you guys are distanced, you probably don't have to think you have to worry about illness or missing class or, or a variety of these sorts of things. Here, here's what the real story is. As far as I'm concerned, if you have some sort of personal crisis, whatever the nature is, let me know or let the TAs know. And if you need extra time on stuff, 
we'll give it to you. I don't need notes from your doctor or any of that crap. I want us to, this to be a partnership and you're learning ecology and are trying to help you learn ecology. And if you're sick or you have other, other issues, it's going to get in the way of that. Why can't we be human beings and just give you, you know, extra time if that's what you need? Anyway, that's my policy and use it as you need it. Uh, I'm hoping that disability issues will be less of a impediment for us with a distance course. But if there are issues, my speed of my speaking, I don't know, need for um, captions for my lectures or something like that, please let me know. Um, I think the cheating and citation stuff pretty much speaks for itself. And um, this last, there's some final points here uh, that uh, I think it's important for you to look at, but I'm not necessarily going to go through specifically. Uh, but I would like to highlight just a couple things. Um, the first is, if I just scoop my way back a little bit here, um, when I have I had classroom safety and emergency procedures, which I'm required to put in the syllabus. Hey, we don't have those, but here's one thing. Save all your assignments. Please save all your assignments. And make, I know this sounds stupid, but put your name on your assignments. Every single semester we get students who don't have names on assignments, and it drives us crazy. Um, sometimes homos, homicidally crazy. So you, you want to make, make certain of that, that you take care of that. The other things on a more general way, um, there's a statement in here about getting help. I have uh, mental, I have mental health problems. I've been clinically depressed now for, I've had clinical depression, diagnosed clinical depression for over 20 years. And thankfully I've got drugs to take care of it. I'm pretty open about these things. Um, my guess is given the age range of students in the course and my previous experience plus what I read, a significant proportion of you, something probably between 20 and 35 percent, are experiencing or periodically experience some sort of mental health crisis. Um, Depression is probably the most common, but uh, anxiety ailments and so forth. Look, I'm with you guys. I've got it. You don't, it's no, there's no confession and there's no stigma to it. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't stigmatize people with broken arms. I don't stigmatize people with mental health issues. I want you to know that both I and other members of the department here are, are available to work with you on that. So it's, again, it's much more difficult when we've got this kind of impersonal um, form of teaching, but I want you to know that um, there's, there's uh, a lifeline if you need to grab it. How's that for, that's kind of poetic, right? Um, one other thing I want to say is item five here, take written notes. I'm not sure how you're going to listen to these, listen and watch these lectures, but I think it's important to point out that the human brain processes information differently in terms of how it's received. In other words, your listening to me speak is processed differently than if you were reading my words on a page. And just listening as you are right now versus seeing me speak is also different. Um, one of the reasons I have trouble getting things ready for class is I want to get a better quality video. People complain about talking heads as professors, but I know both from reading research and my own personal experience that students respond differently when they see one person talking. In upcoming lectures, I hope to have one or, one or both of the TAs here, and rather than just lecture to you, we'll, we'll discuss those things. And again, you will learn about that, and your brain will process that information in a different way. Um, the strongest recommendation I can give you for doing well in here is to make sure you take notes. And if you do what my piano teacher taught me, which was this, after you learn something, wait a day, and then revisit it. Uh, for piano, uh, my teacher, Seal Brown, used to say, don't practice this piece for at least a day, but then start your ordinary practice. Um, I would say that if you can schedule yourself so you take some notes on a lecture, you go back the next day and maybe just skim those notes or outline them, that is a fantastic way to ensure that things you're not certain about are covered. I think that's about as much as I want to say right here. Um, in, this, in what amounts to the second half of this lecture, I'll talk to you about uh, some elements and basic principles in ecology. Again, won't take long. And then uh, we'll move from that into talking about science. Uh, I guess before I close, I should tell you that it's all been my experience in doing distance lectures that they typically cram, they typically have a higher information content than lectures on campus. 
by which I mean if I look at notes or I look at what I'm working on, I can cover the same amount of material I can in much less time when I do a lecture like this that's being recorded than I can in class. And I think that's because even in a large lecture class, there is a certain interaction that you have with the class. Here, I interact with the camera or I interact with the screen and you know, sort of pretend, myself, to, pretend to myself that people are out there listening. And um, if I can get, get my motivation going and so forth, um, it appears that more information is conveyed. So you're not getting cheated if these lectures only run 20 or 30 minutes. I guess, is that what I want to say? Um, I also am anxious as we get feedback from you in terms of what lengths seem to work best for you. I've, I've never understood why we have 50-minute lecture periods. I've, I've not really seen any evidence to suggest that's the appropriate length of time. And based upon my own judgment, I can always see students starting to fall asleep after 25 minutes. So maybe we should either should have 25 25 minute lectures or we need to structure our lectures so there's a, a break in there. I don't know, but that's something we'll talk to you about down the line. Uh, I'm glad you're in the course. Hopefully we can get this thing rolling properly and uh, I'll be talking to you again soon.